Well, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. I guess good morning to you, Alexis, and thank you. And and, and welcome to everyone. For uh, as, Alexis men as Alexis mentioned, this is our second installment of the 2014 IOA Energy Webinar Series. And I, too, would like to uh, uh, call out and thank our series sponsor, Bates White, for their support. Uh, and indeed, I'm on the line today from Santo Domingo. So I, I should quickly mention that it is not too late to join us tomorrow here in Santo Domingo for our Caribbean Natural Gas forum. Well, of course, I, uh, if you're in Santo Domingo, we do hope you might come out and, and join us here at the Hilton for our discussion of natural gas issues in the Caribbean. But uh, don't worry if you can't make it tomorrow. Uh, we have plenty more in store in the, in the energy realm on March 13th. Our next webinar on the oil sands in Canada, that'll be on March 13th. And then uh, we're organizing a Southern Cone Energy Roundtable March 18th in Montevideo, Uruguay. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention our 23rd annual La Jolla Energy Conference, May 21st and 22nd. Well, right, today's webinar focused on Venezuela. And I have to say, I've been hearing a lot about Venezuela in the 24 hours I've been, been here in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. And uh, I, it, it's just always amazing how interesting a topic Venezuela provides for these kinds of discussions. And um, there's all kinds of debate always, uh, the, the bombastic political system on top of the immense resource potential. Uh, and, and I have to add, uh, of late, you put on top of all of the usual issues in Venezuela and you add this latest dimension of the last few years of the U.S. energy boom and now news of huge dips in uh, exports of Venezuelan oil to the United States uh, as a byproduct of the U.S. energy revolution. And so uh, I would just suggest that you take what is already or has been an amazingly complex topic, an interesting topic, and you add just yet another wrinkle. And uh, uh, of course, we're talking about natural gas in the Caribbean here tomorrow as part of our forum. And again, that's also an issue. The What I would say are the never quite ready natural gas projects in Venezuela but it's something that folks in the Caribbean are keen to understand a little bit more on the future, uh, maybe longer term. Um, and I have to say, there's no better person to help us untangle some of these issues or all of these issues and share the latest on what is happening than my good friend David Vogt. And David, is men as Alexis mentioned, is managing director, but I, sh I, I should add founder of IPD Latin America and is, a, is an outright expert on, on Venezuela and not just the energy sector, but, but the, the entire political system uh, in, in energy as well. And he spent over 15 years analyzing Venezuela, both from afar, but more importantly in Caracas. And so he really has had his finger on the pulse. And so without further ado, I want to invite David to share his latest insights. And I want to just say thank you, uh, David, because I know uh, this is always a tricky topic and you always find such a way to present it without, uh, uh, you know, sticking your foot in your mouth. So uh, thank you for agreeing to join us. And it's always great to have you with us. So over to you, David. As I uh, clear my throat before uh, trying to avoid sticking my foot in my mouth on, on this my very first uh, on this my very first webinar. So I thank everyone for their patience as I uh, uh, try to navigate my way through this uh, technology myself here. But I know Jeremy and Alexis, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to work with you guys and to uh, open up a discussion on Venezuela. I think uh, there's um, uh, we we have a, a, a series uh, called Venezuela a Maze of Change, um, which is uh, you know it's it's over a hundred slides, and what I've tried to do is uh, take some of those slides that uh, maybe we can use today to tell a little bit of a story, um, give uh, folks a status of uh, what's going on in Venezuela. Um, you know, there's there's always the big question of uh, production levels, there's always a big question of where the risk is. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about uh, new projects in the Orinoco Belt. I'd like to maybe take a little bit of time to discuss uh, why there's so much talk there. Um, uh, I think that given the time restraints, uh, while natural gas offshore is, is, is certainly um, maybe uh, uh, getting new legs, uh, I'm going to stay focused on extra heavy oil today. And uh, maybe in the question and answer uh, period, we could talk a little bit about gas uh, or, or save it for next uh, webinar. Um, Alexis, I'm not sure that I have control of my slides at this point in time.
Um, sorry about that. Let me go and double check that. But for the moment, let me put you on the first slide so you can start talking while I fix that. All right, great. Well, the first slide is, is easy. Oh, we, we are <laughs> we are consultants. That that first slide here. We are we are consultants. Uh, um, we are not responsible for anything we ever say. Uh, but in this case, we just believe that the information that we obtain is from reliable sources, uh, and uh, we have made our judgments accordingly. Um, so you can go on to the next slide, Alexis. You now have power restored. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I see it. Great, thank you. Um, so, so folks, I, I guess we start off by um, talking a little bit about why uh, Venezuela is so interesting to foreign investors, and it's it's pretty simple. The country currently has the largest certified reserves in the world um, after uh, the last several years of the Magna Reserve project. Uh, Venezuela has certified, uh, independently certified, I should say, uh, 297.7 uh, billion barrels of crude oil uh, in place. Um, what's interesting and important to understand here is that uh, a massive proportion of those in, in the pie chart on the left in red, 257 billion, is extra heavy oil. Uh, so we can understand why uh, it's reasonable that the Venezuelan government would um, really look to focus on its Orinoco Belt uh, heavy oil reserves. Um, I thought it would be interesting to also frame this discussion by taking a look at the macroeconomic environment in Venezuela um, over the last several years. And in particular, I wanted to take a look, uh, start by taking a look at the early 90s um, because Venezuela was successful at building uh, four multi-billion dollar extra heavy oil projects in a period where you had hyperinflation, where GDP was uh, inconsistent and, and, and largely negative. Um, and while this chart does not show that, that green line, the chart does not show this well at all. Um, this is the uh, exchange rate. Um, uh, there, there was, uh, in the 90s, a currency control, as there is today. So, so basically, we're looking at hyperinflation in both periods. We're looking at uh, uh, difficult GDP in both periods. Uh, inflation, I'm sorry, foreign exchange, though, is interesting. Uh, the chart doesn't show it well, but uh, Venezuela actually had 1,400% devaluation between 1993 and 2003, in which time um, PDVSA was able to partner with and successfully build uh, four massive extra heavy oil projects. Um, in 2003 to 2013, um, the percentage of devaluation is about 294%. So it's much less uh, a, a benefit there um, in terms of building new projects. But th the point here is that we really do believe that with a certain uh, uh, commitment uh, to new projects in the Orinoco Belt, um, the, the government can uh, work within a difficult economic environment to be successful in building these projects. And we'll certainly talk about this throughout the presentation. Uh, with this next slide, uh, basically what we have here are the current market conditions and, and project risks. And uh, basically, um, when we take a look at market risk, we look at uh, the potential for an oil price drop. Um, when those first projects were built back in the 90s, uh, they were built in a less than $20 a barrel uh, price environment. Uh, today, we've got about a $100 uh, price environment. And uh, the, the, the deal here, though, is that we have a downside, which is that prices could fall and uh, could cause some complexity in, in project development because of that. Um, with those original projects, there, there was a, a marketing risk. Um, nobody had ever really tried to market Syncrude and uh, nobody was sure exactly how the market would accept that new product. Turned out to accept it quite well. Um, uh, today, we have a question of how the market will accept extra heavy oil blended with Syncrude. Um, but I think that that risk is less. I think that uh, um, Pedevesa and, and the partners in these uh, upcoming heavy oil projects are a little bit more familiar with the market, but it, it's still a minor risk there. The other market risk would be Petavesa's high yield curve, uh, basically the expense um, uh, of, of financing. 
sovereign risk? Well, actually, sovereign risk today, according to the rating agencies, is, is, is about a B. And uh, um, uh, Venezuela uh, sovereign was rated B during those original four projects as well. So we have similar sovereign risk. Um, there's a recent history of government intervention in the industry and nationalization. Uh, I think this is relevant because, it, it, you know, if we take a look back, when these projects, when, when the four original projects were built, um, uh, nationalization of the entire oil industry had only happened about uh, 20 years earlier. And uh, now we're looking at you know, a 15-year period from when President Chavez took power, time flies. And uh, to a certain extent, I think that uh, the memory of nationalization is similar in both cases. So, so, so that, that risk was kind of similar. Um, today, we have a government take of above 70%. And I have a slide on that, so I won't go into that uh, right now. And we certainly have uh, some concerns with, with contract sanctity. Uh, which would need to be um, really handled carefully by the government and uh, the Ministry uh, of Energy in, in order to move these projects, these new projects forward. Project risk, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, availability of diluent, um, about uh, the complexity of uh, building uh, new infrastructure uh, to handle all the production of this heavy oil. Um, and we'll, we'll also look at um, uh, foreign exchange controls and, and uh, how they can impact projects. Uh, you know, I think it's really worthwhile to understand uh, for these companies that are involved in these projects that um, a, a stable uh, forex regime is absolutely critical in order to uh, maintain the economies of uh, these very, very large investments. Um, the other risk, or the final risk that I have, at least on this slide, is the fact that the government is discussing the construction of six large-scale projects at the same time. And, and we'll take a look at timing on these projects as well and um, discuss a little bit the difficulties of getting all these projects built uh, together. So um, I guess just to try to um, uh, look at, um, you know, what investment uh, we're going to be seeing in Venezuela in terms of priorities and, and why. Um, I think first we need to take a look at PDVSA's operations and, and, and production. And um, unfortunately, we don't yet have official production numbers from 2013. Uh, but we can talk about 2012 uh, when, according to PDVSA, um, uh, production was uh, closed the year at about uh, 2.92 million barrels a day. Um, our estimates are that uh, Petavesa produced about 2.85 million barrels a day in 2013 and closed the year at about 2.75 million barrels a day. So we have some uh, decline and um, uh, part of that is uh, due to uh, uh, lack of uh, ability to manage capex as required and um, what I'd like to do though is 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 take a look at um, sort of why that is uh, well first of all we see that in in this slide uh, total capex has increased uh, quite dramatically and and in 2013 our estimate was that uh, about 25 billion dollars was spent um, uh, by uh, Petavesa. However, when you take a look at the light gray bar, uh, you see that EMP CapEx was only just over 10 billion. Now, uh, we estimate that you need about 10 to $12 billion in EMP CapEx in order to maintain production levels. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, we think that uh, Petavesa did a reasonably good job last year. Um, uh, you know, I would say for, for the annual average uh, production was uh, more or less stagnant. Um, what's interesting to see with these green, uh, blue, and, and red lines here is that total production has, has, has fallen, in, in this case, in, in the case of this graph, since 2006. Um, and, and, and what I'd just like to mention is that the joint venture production, the production from mixed companies, has increased, and it's really offset a fallen production uh, operated exclusively by PDVSA. So here we see uh, the importance of having joint venture partners. 
And in the next slide, uh, we take a look at Venezuela oil output by region, and we see that production has declined uh, in the West uh, and in the East, um, where uh, that production has been offset uh, by the Orinoco oil belt projects. Um, in particular, the heavy oil projects operated by, or, or the projects themselves, uh, Sinovenza operated by the Chinese, Petro PR operated by um, uh, Chevron and Petro Monagas operated by Rosneft uh, saw increases. Uh, um, Sinovenza has been investing a lot of money. They've been working very efficiently with Petavesa and, uh, and, and we'll take a look on the next slide uh, in more detail of, of uh, what their increases were. Um, Petro PR had a deep bottlenecking in. They've increased production and, and Petro Monagas has increased production even beyond upgrader capacity. So they're now marketing um, uh, diluted crude oil, uh, 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 an interesting fact to keep in mind. Um, with this slide here, we can see that there have been some success stories with production in Venezuela. Um, again, uh, Petro Boscan, uh, uh, which recovered production to 110,000 barrels a day after OPEC uh, cuts in Q4 of 2008, um, plans to increase production to 145,000 barrels in 2015. Um, one of the ways that they're going to be able to do that, we're, we're confident of, is the fact that they have uh, signed a, a $2 billion loan with PETAVESA. Um, this loan allows for certain aspects of the contract uh, of the joint venture to be restructured uh, so that cash flow can be moved offshore and so that uh, Chevron can uh, gain a little bit more uh, management control and offer up the, the value that it has to contribute in terms of uh, technical expertise uh, and management knowledge. Uh, so so we'll, we'll expect to see Petroboscan increasing production uh, up to two 2015. Um, uh, Petrodelta, uh, Harvest Natural Resources, um, increased production from 15,000 barrels a day in 2008 to 40,000 barrels a day uh, last year. Uh, uh, ONGC has had uh, success. Uh, again, we see Sinovenza um, production hike to 135,000 barrels a day from 50,000 barrels a day in, in 2008. Uh, again, another uh, mega loan of uh, $4 billion, uh, allowing this mixed company to also restructure and, uh, and create a more productive environment for uh, increasing production. Uh, Petro Monagas uh, recovery to 140,000 barrels after very, very stringent. You can see in the, the, the red uh, line in the graph to the left um, in, in 2009, um, OPEC cuts. Uh, Venezuela had basically shut in Petro Monagas. So um, they've worked hard to get production up there. Uh, and again, the Petro PR uh, recovery to 170,000 barrels a day from a two, uh, 2008 low of uh, 108,000 barrels a day. Um, so we do have some success stories. We are seeing that it is uh, feasible for joint ventures to move forward with uh, additional production. Um, now, in order to do that, uh, uh, you need to have some some solid economics in place. And, and one of the areas where we think uh, uh, Petavesa, or really the sovereign, um, needs to, to look at improving matters is with uh, G2G, government-to-government uh, -government supply agreements. Um, in, in, in the case of Venezuela today, about 30% of production is exported under prepaid and G2G supply agreements. Uh, that means that cash doesn't come in uh, to Petavesa's coffers directly necessarily. Uh, and here you can see uh, through the years the number of barrels that have been dedicated um, specifically to these uh, agreements and, and uh, which the agreements are. Um, in, in this next slide, what we've tried to depict, uh, and I think very importantly so, is um, uh, how many barrels have, have, have truly encroached upon Petavesa's cash flow management. And this is still um, uh, quite honestly, an important number of barrels, not quite uh, as many as, as uh, in, in the previous slide. Um, now, when we take a look at that previous slide, this black line here represents um, sort of royalty holiday uh, that the government has given to PETAVESA. And I think this is important to show 
that in a number of years, particularly if you take a look at 2008 and 2009, um, uh, the government has pretty much reimbursed PDVSA through royalty holidays for that opportunity cost uh, in, in cash flow of these uh, G2G agreements. So what you end up seeing then is um, less impact on PDVSA, but certainly uh, an important impact. Um, and, uh, and, and one that needs to be taken into account when we understand uh, PDVSA's cash flow restraints. Uh, we firmly believe that the government should reconsider uh, or, or restructure these G2G accords as one option to improving PDVSA's uh, financial health and uh, allowing the company to really invest in its core activity. Um, here we have a slide on government take, and I'd like to try to um, give you all sort of a, a mental map as to what this slide really says. If we take a look at the green line in, in, in 2013, um, we see that uh, PETAVESA had export revenue of uh, $91.3 billion. Uh, when we, we, we can then subtract about $14 billion, which uh, PETAVESA did not receive directly uh, due to the G2G Accords. Um, that leaves about $77 billion. Uh, we'll then subtract about $25 billion in CapEx, which leaves about $52 uh, billion remaining in the pot. Uh, if you take a look at the red bars here, you're looking at um, uh, social, social and fiscal uh, contributions. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, you're looking at about $64 billion for 2013, which leaves PETAVESA with a deficit of $12 billion um, without taking into account OPEX and debt service. And uh, OPEX was about $20 billion in 2013. Um, so this is why we see that PETAVESA today has a liability with the central bank of about $40 billion uh, and a liability with uh, service providers, um, both um, oil field service companies as well as um, uh, those uh, providers that are different from the oil industry, uh, like for example, food importers, uh, et cetera, um, of uh, additionally billions of dollars. Um, the and, and, and this, I think, is important because we believe that PETAVESA still has a fair amount of flexibility uh, to um, create an environment in which it can finance the number of projects uh, that it needs to finance. And we're going to take a look at um, that burden in, in the next few slides. But if you can somehow limit your G2G uh, accord uh, opportunity cost, and your social contributions opportunity cost to a certain extent, as they did in 2009. If you take a look at the bar 2009, oil prices had fallen. They needed uh, to um, do something, and they did so um, by decreasing social expenditures. Then you see that there is some wiggle room. There is some room to play uh, with financing these projects. So here, um, uh, we take a look. This looks a little bit different than it did in my PowerPoint presentation. Sorry uh, for the format. Um, but here, we take a look at uh, the projects uh, that are on the drawing board. So what do we know? From looking at the economics of the country, from looking at uh, PETAVESA's finance, we know that PETAVESA needs to lift production. Uh, we also know that PETAVESA has made the Orinoco Belt a priority. Um, we also know that financing or the ability to finance uh, projects is going to be uh, finite. So these are the projects uh, that are on the drawing board right now. And uh, what I would say uh, to this slide is that um, pretty much the, uh, there are too many projects on the drawing board to execute all at once. Um, and when we take a look at the next slide, uh, we'll see uh, exactly what the the numbers are. And in PETAVESA's business plan, um, and, and, and this is slightly adjusted by IPD, so it's not PETAVESA's official business plan, but an approximation uh, we have of about $109 billion 
um, uh, on the table in order to uh, build uh, six upgraders and uh, increase production from the Orinoco belt by about two million barrels per day. Um, this is a nice plan, uh, but it's extremely aggressive given uh, the, the ability to, to finance. Um, for example, with just the mixed company projects, which include upstream development and upgrade or refinery construction, you're talking $65.5 billion through 2018. Infrastructure, industrial condominiums uh, to manage services like marine terminal, uh, solid disposal terminal and oil pipelines, you're looking at $20.4 billion. And the Orinoco Socialist Project, which looks at more basic infrastructure like roads, railroads, uh, services like water and electricity, schools, hospitals, you're looking at another $23.2 billion. So just to take a look at, in, in this next slide, at uh, the infrastructure that's necessary. Um, basically, we have in the lower right-hand corner, let me see if I can actually uh, draw the, or get a, Okay, down here in the lower right-hand corner, uh, we have a, um, a um, industrial park, which would provide a number of different uh, services for the heavy crude upgrading facilities. Here we have uh, liquids and solids products terminals. We've got pipelines to run um, diluted crude oil and uh, diluent. Uh, and this is for Carabobo, uh, for the Hunin projects here, again, pipelines. Um, the industrial park has been put on hold temporarily here, uh, so we need to see sort of what's happening with changes in the business plan with regards to um, infrastructure. But um, uh, we see here, I guess if you take a look right up here, this is the Jose Industrial Park where all the current heavy crude projects are, are crude is processed. What we see here is a huge challenge in basically building all of this infrastructure in an area where there is no infrastructure at all. So you need roads, you need rail, um, you're going to need to be bringing entire refineries for assembly from the coast uh, down to Falconero, for example. Um, you do have the Orinoco River here, which would serve as, uh, definitely as a benefit for transportation, um, but it's challenging. That's the, the message here, uh, I would say, is just absolutely challenging. Um, the next uh, slide um, shows you um, a little bit about the projects that are um, uh, currently in place or, or the status of the current extra heavy oil projects. Um, while most of these are finishing up their basic engineering, which is necessary before a final invest investment decision can be made, I think it really is important um, to understand that a lot of activity has been taking place. Uh, so that people will really get the picture that things are moving forward. Um, you can see here uh, when seismic was done, you can see uh, here uh, the, that, that most of these projects have already started drilling uh, clusters, uh, completing wells, and in several cases you already have uh, some early production. Um, early production in particular is going to be really critical um, as uh, this aspect of the project serves to finance the heavy uh, crude upgrading facilities. So uh, efficiency is going to be key um, with early production. But again, plenty of early activity happening in the Orinoco Belt. Um, so that all being said, there, there are a number of challenges in getting these Orinoco Belt projects off the ground. Um, we take a look at project execution, uh, rig availability. After the nationalization of, of, of service companies, it's been difficult uh, to get rigs into the country. Um, you're you're going to have to improve rig availability in order to meet uh, goals. Uh, similarly with supply of goods and services, um, uh, we have a, a limit, a limited uh, number of experienced labor. We have a limited number of service companies. Uh, this needs to be beefed up in order to meet certain goals. Um, 
the other issue is simultaneous uh, multiple project execution. Uh, these projects are going to need to be staggered. And uh, if we, we take a look back at that uh, slide on infrastructure, um, the level of infrastructure is also going to need to be staggered in order to uh, meet uh, I think more realistic demand of uh, upgraders and, uh, and and therefore we would like to see a restructuring of the business model for infrastructure development uh, so that we can maybe start off with a couple projects, uh, get them financed, get them built, um, build some benchmarks and, and some trust in the financial markets and then move on to additional projects. Uh, the other uh, challenge with project execution is project management. Um, uh, here, uh, Pedavesa needs to um, really uh, put in place uh, uh, solid uh, project management teams that have the autonomy uh, from the, the company's board of directors and the company's president uh, to move forward uh, on projects and, and have decision-making uh, ability. Uh, we think that's going to be important. Um, diluent availability, for those of you who aren't too familiar with extra heavy oil production, um, one of the most important things is having diluent, which is typically a crude that's about 30 degrees API, much lighter crude, used to blend with the heavy crude in order to transport. And um, IPD has done an extensive analysis of the diluent market, and uh, we see um, light crude production in Venezuela falling through uh, our analysis window, which is 2020, um, uh, while uh, demand for uh, light crude increases uh, substantially. Um, you, it's important to remember that you've got light crude contracted out uh, by Petavesa and other refineries abroad. Um, the, G, the G2G accords also uh, require light crude exports. We've got uh, new Orinoco oil belt early production. You've got uh, the necessity for Petavesa blending and you've got demand from Petavesa refineries in Venezuela. All of that demand, when met with uh, falling light crude production, means that by 2020, we expect a deficit of a little over 600,000 barrels a day in light crude. Um, uh, quite an important uh, uh, deficit there. Um, uh, so, so diluent is something that we need to watch very carefully in order to measure how successful we can, how successfully we can build out these extra heavy oil projects. Infrastructure, uh, again, uh, new Orinoco oil belt transportation, uh, storage and loading facilities, uh, industrial services. I think also very important to mention is that the existing pipeline structure in Venezuela is export oriented. And when we see the need to be importing uh, extensive amounts of diluent, uh, we need to look at that infrastructure uh, and assess the investment required uh, to build new infrastructure. Um, financing. Uh, again, early production is going to be key. We need to have an efficient environment uh, for uh, early production in order to generate the cash flow necessary to guarantee project financing. Um, we work with a number of different banks and financial institutions and, and in our discussions with them, uh, we believe that project financing today is quite difficult. Um, however, it's not impossible. Um, alignment of partners' interest uh, is, is going to be key, particularly with financing. Uh, and um, we need to also pay very close attention to the fact that there are a number of other projects besides the Orinoco Belt that uh, Petavase is involved in, and uh, uh, obviously the company has limited resources to be investing in all of its projects. So to conclude, um, we believe that you really do need alignment uh, in order to uh, successfully build out uh, energy infrastructure and projects in, in Venezuela. And you need alignment between the sovereign, between between the government, PETAVESA and the private sector. Uh, we feel that the government really does need to correct macroeconomic distortions. Uh, by that, principally, 
I would say, or at the forefront, would be the foreign exchange regime. Um, we've seen some indication recently from Rafael Ramirez, the, the vice president of the economy, that um, they uh, may be taking steps to do so. Uh, we hope that's the case. Um, we also need to see the sovereign improve transparency and uh, reporting to the financial markets. Uh, the financial markets are becoming very concerned about a possible default. Um, more information would help calm those markets. Um, uh, we think it's absolutely critical and because uh, today the Venezuelan economy is in such a complex position uh, that, it, that it really is hard to isolate the oil industry uh, from uh, this ma the macroeconomic issues in the country, uh, making it hard to finance these projects. Um, we think that the sovereign should refocus its crude export strategy. By this, I mean uh, take a second look at the G2G accords and the opportunity costs that uh, PDVSA is facing because of these accords. Um, uh, we think that the government should reprioritize contract sanctity and contract consistency. Um, uh, by that, I mean it has to give uh, investors uh, more confidence in the fact that once they sign agreements, these agreements will be followed, followed very closely. Um, that has not happened in the past. It does need to happen in the future. Uh, we'd like to see the sovereign enable PDVSA. We'd like to see the sovereign give PDVSA a mandate, um, as the sovereign did um, back when these, uh, when the four original heavy crude projects were built. And once that mandate is given, we want to see the sovereign hold PDVSA accountable uh, for making that mandate happen. Um, in terms of PDVSA, same thing as the sovereign. We need to see PDVSA um, increasing its communication with the financial market and increasing a frequency by which it reports uh, on uh, the company's operational and financial results. As an example, uh, we have not seen uh, since the first half of 2013 any production numbers. Uh, that, that's critical, and I think that's critical also in dispelling a lot of rumors um, uh, about production, uh, which only ends up hurting uh, PDVSA. So, so reporting is going to be critical. Um, create real partnerships. Uh, we'd like to see PDVSA put some more faith in its uh, minority partners and endow those partners with responsibility uh, for project development. Uh, we'd like to see PDVSA prioritize its projects and, and uh, uh, really um, put some coordination in the development of projects so that the right amount of money is spent for the right amount of build out and, uh, and you can start to see some realistic development of good solid projects. Uh, again, the uh, adopting uh, project management best practices is something where we feel uh, PDVSA should be focusing on. And for the private sector, well, the private sector is obviously looking to bring solutions, uh, to bring its technology and its know-how. Uh, the private sector needs to continue to work to engage uh, both the Ministry of Energy and uh, the government. Um, the private sector uh, should be able to manage risk effectively and from the companies that we've seen operating in Venezuela, we believe they certainly uh, have talent at managing risk. That They need to keep doing that on an ongoing basis. Uh, the, the, the private sector needs to bring its financial muscle and uh, the PDVSA and the sovereign need to allow these projects to be uh, defined so that the private sector's financial muscle will mean something uh, uh, when it comes down to working with the banks and, and, and getting money uh, for these uh, uh, CapEx intensive projects. And, uh, and, and then again, the private sector should be able to support solid execution. Um, there haven't really been any mega projects built in Venezuela over uh, the, the last 15 years. Um, everybody's going to be on a very uh, vertical learning curve and uh, we believe that the private sector can certainly support PDVSA uh, in the development of these projects. Once you get this alignment and this commitment, uh, we really do believe that um, you can, you can uh, generate some, some decent success uh, with development of projects in, in Venezuela. Uh, so with that, um, I, I will uh, end my remarks. Um, 
uh, there's uh, my email uh, in the event that you'd like to send me a note and, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of the, the presentation. Thank you very much, David. That was that was fantastic. Uh, I think we've already started to receive a few questions. I have no doubt that the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes will fly by. But uh, that was that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly go over the question logistics again for people, uh, especially those who signed on a bit late. Uh, on the right hand side of the page, you can see a chat icon, and under it, a chat tab and a question tab. Uh, I see a few people have put questions in the in the chat section. That's not a big problem, except that it allows you to write really long questions and then they don't appear on the screen and it's a bit difficult. So if you could please use the, the question tab and I will moderate and put them up on the screen and uh, David will respond one by one. So without further ado, and I don't want to waste any more of your time, let's uh, get into the first question here. It's a, a bit of a political question. I don't know how much you want to wade into this. David, but as you can see, what's your opinion on the current governance crisis and how this is affecting project investment and execution? All right. Well, um, obviously, uh, any type of governance crisis in a country is going to affect uh, project investment and, and execution. Um, it, this is one of the reasons why uh, I mentioned in the presentation that we really would like to see uh, the government make corrections, particularly to macroeconomic distortions. In Venezuela right now, you you have, um, I guess, two main issues um, that are uh, uh, creating social uh, discontent, uh, to say the least. Um, one of them is security. Um, the other is uh, more economically related and has to do with scarcity. Um, uh, difficulty obtaining dollars to import goods uh, and obviously over the years increasing number of imports into the country. Um, uh, as as uh, folks start to get impatient with the government, um, it's absolutely going to uh, distract the government uh, from, um, uh, from, from projects and, and, and I guess uh, to a large extent, with Rafael Ramirez being the, the, the vice president of the economy now, um, he's going to be distracted from decisions in the oil industry. Um, uh, uh, so to that end, I would just uh, also remind everyone that we did just have a uh, restructuring of the energy ministry. Uh, we have a couple new uh, vice ministers now, and um, we believe that there there is going to be some more responsibility taken over by the vice ministers, um, hopefully uh, allowing this deflection of uh, focus, uh, Rafa Ramirez's focus, um, uh, to be to be limited uh, and, and and move forward with with projects, but but clearly um, there uh, there is going to be some sort of uh, uh, delay or, or or some sort of uh, lack of focus on projects uh, due to the governance crisis. Thank you. I, I think the next is a sort of a two part question uh, about so energy sales from Venezuela to US are at lowest levels in twenty eight years. Uh, what, how is it increasing expensive shipments to China and India? And there's actually a second part to this question asking whether or not PDVSA is losing out by exporting to China to repay loans. Right. Okay. No, good questions. Um, uh, my, my perception is whether, whether Venezuela did this on purpose or not, um, it has spent the last few years uh, looking to diversify its markets away from the United States. And it turns out that that may have been a really good idea, uh, given the success that the United States has had with, with shale. Um, uh, diversifying the markets to China and India, well, that's uh, that's natural because those are the countries uh, that have the most demand. And I, I think that if you take a look at a country uh, that is more commercially oriented uh, with, with its exports, like Colombia, Colombia, you'll also see that that country is increasing its exports to India and, and China. Um, so I think the unfortunate thing is that the U.S. has, um, to a large extent, been the major cash flow uh, supplier, uh, given the fact, uh, to PDVSA, given the fact that its exports or that its imports have been cash-based and, and not repayments for loans. However, I also would like people to understand that not all of the 
uh, exports to China, for example, are going to repay loans. Uh, Petavasa certainly has uh, cash income as well. Um, and, and then just to, to close off this question, uh, I would say that it's important to understand the dynamics in Venezuela where, where business deals are, are almost merged among institutions. So in this case, you could assume that the sovereign and PDVSA are benefiting from these Chinese loans. Of course, PDVSA then um, uh, takes some of the burden to repay those loans. Um, but, but there has been sort of a merge, so it's a very different paradigm in how business is done. Um, uh, obviously, there is, there is some opportunity cost for PDVSA, and there will continue to be. Hmm. Um, can I just ask a really quick follow-up question about opportunity costs for PDVSA and loans and exports? And, and did you get any sort of sense while you were there of what's happening with the Petrocaribe uh, loans and how that, because obviously that's another impact on the, uh, the cash flow to PDVSA. Yeah, in, in, in a public environment, I'd rather not comment. Um, uh, what I can say is from, from IPD's perspective, um, we, we think that the, the Petrocaribe agreements uh, should be reviewed. Um, it's important that the, the, the agreements um, be honored uh, in, in the way that they were originally intended. Um, and one of the problems that I have is that they have not been in the sense that uh, some of the countries have been offering goods and services in lieu of cash. Um, and, and I think once you get into that kind of barter system, you start to lose fiscal control. And, and I'd like to see PDVSA regain that fiscal control as much as possible. All right, so I'll ask, that, that's definitely a good start. I might ask you off the record later then. So, but moving back to the public questions, uh, we have one here from uh, Pietro Pietz. A lot of J, uh, joint venture partners, express, uh, partners sorry, expressing concern with development of the Farhub projects. Should this be a concern for PDVSA? Well, I think that PDVSA is fully aware of what the joint venture partners' concerns are. Um, they're, they're obvious concerns dealing with delays, dealing with the things that we discussed in our presentation, contract sanctity, um, financing uh, capacity, uh, et cetera. And, um, uh, you know, there are things that, that the companies and, and PDVSA are working through. From, from our perspective, these projects are a priority for PDVSA. And uh, again, I think that uh, what we'd like to see is for PDVSA to kind of choose an order um, in which these projects should be developed and uh, work, work on focusing on, on a couple projects at a time, um, you know, dedicating its limited human resources to getting a couple projects off the ground, um, uh, financed and, and uh, making the logistics work. Um, it's, it's not going to be an easy process for anybody and, uh, you know, it, it's going to take some time. Hmm. Well, moving right along, we have a question here about, uh, again, developing, I think this is, well, I think we're missing a bit here. Um, I apologize. Let me ask that person who asked that question to please do it again and you're missing the last part. Let's skip on to the next question quickly. I apologize. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that one if they send us the rest of the question. In the meantime, um, what needs to be done in order to, in terms of boosting refinery capacity? I've actually got a couple of questions here about refineries. So adding to this, what needs to be done from an investment standpoint in refining capacities? I've also got another question over here about uh, refining, will Venezuela continue to import refined products from the U.S. and what's happening in terms of import trends there? Right, okay. Well, um, uh, I would say that IPD is uh, much more strongly focused on the upstream side than the downstream yeah. side. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, obviously and, and very publicly there's been uh, maintenance issues with uh, refineries in Venezuela. Um, some of those maintenance issues are being resolved. Um, uh, they, Venezuela has plans for new refineries uh, in the country. Um, uh, again, those refineries face the same kinds of challenges as uh, the heavy crude upgrading refineries in terms of 
uh, capital expenditures, investment, uh, financing, logistics, etc. Um, so, you know, uh, for, for me, one of the largest issues Venezuela faces is execution capacity. Um, uh, I think PDVSA really does need to work with partners to improve execution capacity. Uh, until it does, you're going to continue with uh, the same sort of bottlenecks uh, in the current refining system that we have today. So we'll have a status quo uh, situation in which uh, uh, PDVSA will have to continue to uh, purchase uh, refined uh, products from abroad and import. Um, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, without a, a strong focus on lifting uh, production, particularly in North Monagas, of light crude, um, we're going to see increasing uh, demand for uh, imports into Venezuela. Um, uh, you know that has a North Monagas has a lot of implications. Uh, I, I think that one of the good things that's happening is we're starting to see projects like Mariscal Sucre uh, and Plataforma del Tana offshore gas projects. Um, really starting to, or giving indications that they're getting their legs, Venezuela needs that gas on shore. Um, uh, the, the, the gas deficit in Venezuela is uh, having a, a negative impact on, on production of light crude in North Monagas, and, and, and that's important to understand. If that can be uh, rectified, uh, then uh, you, you will see a, a positive uh, impact on uh, the amount of uh, light crude and, and refined products imports. To Venezuela. Huh. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. What I'm going to do for the last few questions is sort of focus again, like you said, on the um, on the material that was in your presentation. So I'll focus on the questions that are more uh, upstream or finance uh, capacity financing sort of uh, questions here. So we've only got about five minutes left. So let me uh, move on. Here's a question about heavy oil value and what uh, when if Mexico opens up could Venezuela, what, what would be the impact on the value of Venezuelan crude? Yeah, um, I, I think Mexico is fascinating. Uh, uh, you have a country that's investment grade. You have a country that in every other uh, sector of its economy has had uh, tremendous success, uh, in a, a country that has been willing to open up to free trade agreements. Um, now uh, having... Uh, constitutional reform to allow for uh, much more expansive private sector participation in the oil industry. Of course, we still have to wait for secondary legislation uh, to be presented to see how this industry is going to look. Um, but in my opinion, you could hear a real sucking sound of uh, investment coming out of other parts of Latin America and into Mexico. Uh, I think that would be the, the, the first comment. However, again, we go back to my very first slide, the reserves in Venezuela, um, zero geological risk um, uh, uh, in, in the Orinoco belt. Uh, that, that makes things attractive. So I don't see um, investors running from Venezuela to uh, Mexico. Um, that being said, it, you know Mexico could become major competition uh, for for Venezuela, uh, and uh, with increased heavy crude entering the market, uh, uh, could have an impact on on price. Absolutely. Mm. Well, let's, going back to the sort of PDVSA's uh, specific financial problems, uh, there's a question here about cash flows and GTG agreements again, and maturity bonds, which is. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to get into the weeds here a little bit and maybe talk a little bit more about PDVSA's financial problems and how they're related to these. Yeah, I mean, okay. So, yes, I think I, I've, I've tried to make the point that G2G agreements need to um, be reviewed. Uh, at least that would be our suggestion. Um, with regards to... Um, uh, I think this question refers to the potential for PDVSA to default on, on debt. And... Um, I think the first thing that we would say is that uh, Venezuela and PDVSA have almost a perfect track record. I think that there was one technical glitch uh, with, a, with, with a steel company uh, bond uh, default. Uh, but uh, uh, overall, Venezuela has been uh, very clear uh, that it intends to uh, service its debt on time. Um, uh, again, uh, when I mention the wiggle room that PDVSA has, 
uh, in terms of social expenditures and G2G accords, I think it's important to understand that PDVSA can restructure its business to have more cash flow uh, when it needs it. And uh, that would mean uh, in 2014 paying off um, its, its bonds. Um, so we don't think that in the short term, uh, PDVSA is going to um, uh, have that much trouble paying off its bond. It's going to give priority there. The, the question is, in order to give that priority, um, uh, where is it going to make cuts? And we see that PDVSA has been using service companies uh, and, and, and other, um, the central bank, for example, in order to finance its, its, its own cash flow issues. And so we need to figure out or we need to see whether PDVSA is going to find a balance there in order to um, uh, pay off service companies, get them more integrally involved in new project development in order to lift production, which has to be the number one priority in my opinion. Hmm. Well, I think we're almost uh, we're almost out of time here. So, and there are quite a few questions left, but some of them are, are quite focused on uh, the refined products. So perhaps those people could get in touch with you directly, or or perhaps you could give uh, give some guidance on where they should go for for more of the uh, downstream answers. I don't want to you know waste too much more time. It's almost midday here, but perhaps we could just. Uh, and if you wanted to, if you had a couple of final comments on sort of, you talked a little bit about many of the challenges, but overall you seem to be positive about Venezuela's ability to to improve or at least reverse some of the declines. So how do you sort of see that over the short to medium term in, in, in Venezuela? What's your outlook overall? Are you kind of taking hedging your bets here, David? Right, right. Well, I mean, obviously we need to take a look at political stability and how that's going to play out this year. Um, one of the things that uh, I would, I see this question about um, Bloomberg's survey um, yeah. uh, at 2.45 million barrels a day as of December 2013. I'd be careful with, with that number. Um, we have done a, a, an extensive independent audit of Venezuelan production using hundreds of sources of information and, um, and, and we don't get nearly that low. Um, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, you know, we, we would like to talk with Bloomberg and understand where they get that figure from. Uh, I think that uh, if you're, I, I think that right now we're within 100,000 barrels a day of Petavase's official figures and we feel very comfortable with that. Um, so, so in that sense, uh, I, I did want to kind of just make a, a brief comment on that question. Um, oh, in terms of production this year, we, we don't see the gains that the private sector or the joint ventures made last year. Um, we don't see those gains repeating themselves this year. There, there's um, no similar projects really on the drawing board. Uh, so unless uh, Petavesa does something to reverse its losses, um, we, we would expect to see a continuing fall in, in production uh, this year. Um, uh, you know, that is, uh, you're, you're taking a look at these, uh, focus on these extra heavy oil projects. Um, you're really looking at more long-term uh, production from those projects. So this year and next year are going to be tough uh, for Venezuela. Again, one of the reasons why we think that the macroeconomic uh, reform is, is, is going to be more critical. Well, thank you very much, David. I'm sorry for anybody whose questions we didn't get to. We uh, never have enough time to get to everybody, but that was that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I think you made wonderful use of the time to focus on an area that's uh, an incredibly complex situation in Venezuela. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody else and just remind everybody that we do have several other energy programs here at the Institute of the Americas. We do have another webinar coming up on Canada's oil sands in March. Uh, please join us for that, as well as the La Jolla Energy Conference in, here in uh, La Jolla, California in May. And if you'd like to know more about us, please uh, follow, look us up at www.iamericas.org slash energy. Follow us on Twitter at IOA Energy. We're also on Facebook, if that's your thing. And uh, we'd love to just see you online or at one of our regional programs. So again, thanks to our sponsors, Bates White. And thank you very much to David for giving up uh, his time this morning to talk to us about Venezuela. I'm sure this thanks is so an much, ongoing Alexis. conversation. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you're back online to quickly. 
I, I am, and I tell you, uh, David, thank you, as always, extremely insightful. I, the worst part I just realized uh, during this about dialing in myself from, from Afuera is that Alexa screened my question even today. So uh, I'll have to follow up with you offline on my question as well, David. But uh, uh, I, I especially liked your answer to the question about Mexico because the last time I heard Mexico and big sucking sound in the same sentence, it was uh, Ross Perot saying it. So, so <laughs> thank you for from that wonderful memory. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much. Extremely insightful. So much uh, to talk about there. I think we need to do part two, uh, you know, at the 18 month mark of the Maduro administration. So uh, we hope to see you online again and, and, and see you here it. in La Jolla or there in La Jolla. We'll see you in May in La Jolla. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you, David. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care.